Uh, my name's Tristan. We've got some fantastic talks coming up for you tonight after I've finished. Um, but first of all, I'm going to talk, talk you guys through um, my kind of presentation around improving driving distance and how to improve that by improving your force expression. Um, so a little bit of a fitness, strength and conditioning kind of angle to this, this talk right now. Um, just a bit of housekeeping before we get started. If you need to go to the loo, they're just at the bottom of the stairs. Um, straight ahead. Don't go out to reception, they're just straight ahead of you here. Um, I think that's kind of it really. <laughs> Nothing else. Um, so, this is my talk today. So we're going to talk about how to improve drive distance by improving how you express force or, or what that means. So just to start off with a couple of uh, bits of data, some data points. Um, handicap versus drive distance. So this is some stats that were published a year or so ago by golf.com. And there's a correlation here between handicap and drive distance. Now these are average um, distances and I think underneath there is, your, is the longest drive distance. So there's a fairly straightforward correlation in that the higher your handicap, the lower generally you can drive the ball. I'm not gonna tell you where I fall into this category. So we've got males here and we've got females underneath as well. I don't, oh, we have got a couple um, in terms of, but, but effectively the relationship is, is identical. So the higher your handicap, the, uh, the further you can, oh, sorry, the, the less you can hit the ball, the, the shorter distance you can hit the ball. So what determines drive distance? What is a determinant of drive distance? I'm sure everyone around here has heard of club head speed and this kind of phenomenon of how fast you can swing the, swing the club and, and make contact with the ball. Um, but what actually predicts club head speed, and this is what a lot of research has gone into, is the magnitude of the force that you can create during your downswing, as well as the amplitude of your downswing. So that's effectively the range of, mo range of movement that the club head goes through um, during the downswing. Those two factors predict club head speed, which is influential for drive distance. And it's all of these kind of relationships that we're going to talk about and come back to today. So that's what a long drive looks like. What are the characteristics of low handicap golfers? They've got greater mobility than higher handicap golfers. And they've got greater strength and power than higher handicap golfers. So these two areas I'm going to talk about today, they've got a more efficient swing uh, sequencing as well, which is certainly not what I'm going to talk about. That's what Andy's going to talk about in a bit as well. But effectively, we've already talked about these two points. Okay, so force that you can produce, that's the strength and power element, the amplitude, range of motion or mobility of the individual swing in the club. Which I've just mentioned here. Now these two go together to form this phenomenon, which is impulse. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about this in a moment. But impulse is effectively a combination of force that you can create during a movement, as well as the time that it takes to produce that movement, okay? So we'll talk a bit more about that in um, shortly. Effectively, greater impulses transfer to greater club head speeds. So if you can produce a lot of force in a very short amount of time, the club's gonna be swinging a lot faster, which means the ball travels a lot further. So, as I've just mentioned, so impulse is the force produced during a movement divided by the time taken to generate that force. Little bit of uh, biomechanics, if anyone is interested, I don't want to make you all drop off, but its unit of measurement is newtons per second. And as I've mentioned there, greater impulse directly related to club, greater club head speed. Um, so I want to take you through this Tiger Woods swing next. Because he's not bad. So we'll let this play, hopefully. It's only 30 seconds, but it's a slow-mo. So I want you to pay attention, like don't worry too much about his backswing here. But if I pause it, hopefully, I'll tell you what, I'll let, I'll let it play from the top. So if you pay attention to his downswing, so once he gets to the top, this is what we're gonna talk about. And it's all this movement here. This is what I'm talking about when we're talking about impulse. So the impulse of that movement, creating a lot of force in a short space of time. So just come back to that top again. And I want you to pay attention this time to his lower body, effectively his belt buckle downwards. Um, and just what that movement looks like effectively as he swings through. 
So just one more time there, and I'm going to talk through this again. It's effectively an explosive extension of his hips, his knees, and his ankles. Now, there is granted some lateral movement. His weight transitions from one foot to the other. But effectively, it's, it's a very like a jumping movement. So an explosive movement, um, extending his ankles, knees, and hips all at the same time. Um, and it looks like a jump. That's, what, that's uh, a kind of key element to think about going forward. If I could bring this back up. And there's a lot of force plate analysis as well that has shown that there's a lot of vertical, even though it's a horizontal movement, there's actually a lot of vertical force expressed during a, a golf swing, especially the, the more explosive driving um, type movements. So it's just a, uh, a breakdown of that again. And there's a lot of similarities between a jump and a downswing. So a downswing of drives approximately 0.3 seconds and the upward movement of a vertical jump is about the same amount of time as well. So Producing higher forces in this time frame means a greater impulse. Again, that relationship of force and time to express the force. So people often look at, or we see, you see a lot of things on social media or people's mind first goes to the end product. So what's happening at the hands and the club and, and um, moving fast through that movement, weighting that movement with weighted clubs, medicine ball throws, lateral throws, etc. But there's plenty of um, research and studies out there that show that it's a higher leg strength that has a greater relationship to club head speeds than things like medicine ball throws and rotational power. So it all comes, it all comes from the ground up. So improving your force through the floor improves your speed at the end of the chain. If you think of it as a chain sequence of events, all the force that you can produce through the floor continues up in that positive sequence right out to the end of um, the club head, as long as your sequencing is is on point as well. There's no energy leaks or anything like that. And that comes with being a technically high, uh, a low handicap, a technically a good golfer as well. So piecing this all together again, drive distance is determined by club head speed. Club head speed is determined by impulse, how much force you can produce in a small amount of time. A drive swing shares many physical traits of jumping. Jump height is determined by impulse as well. So in that short amount of time, can I produce a lot of force? And improvements in jump impulse will bring about improvements in, or so I should say, improvements in jump impulse will bring about improvements in club head speed. So how do we improve impulse in order to improve club head speed? So it's force over time. If we take a look at force initially, so increasing maximal force production. And we also need to decrease the time it takes to express that force. So, some simple exercises, and this, this stuff isn't rocket science by any stretch of the imagination. Squatting, deadlifting, hip hinging, Romanian deadlift as an example, or a hip thrust as another example. A split squat and a lunge, all of these have a very strong vertical component to them, so expressing force up and down in the vertical plane. A good set or rep example for a squat, for example, might be four sets of four, a lunge, four sets of five each side. Now there's a note here at the bottom, it's not as bold as I would have liked it, but if you're training in these kind of rep ranges, you want to select a weight that would leave you with one or two reps left in the tank, left in reserve. So that's often how we program here for people doing um, or training for this um, uh, type of um, force expression. If you've got Four reps on your program, you would lift a weight where five might be your maximum. Does that make sense? So exercises to improve your rate of force development to how explosive you can be. And again, not rocket science. Vertical jumping, so body weight jumping, box jumping, so it gives you a target to get to rather than just jumping to an um, anonymous kind of height like a vertical jump might. A loaded jump, so now we're getting light weights in our hands, and that doesn't have to be a, a high number. You certainly wouldn't jump with your body weight. The maximum you might jump with would be up to about 30% of your body weight. <clears throat> Medicine ball toss, again, high vertical component to this. So that's different, obviously, to the rotational throws that I talked about earlier, and a kettlebell swing. It's important to note here as well 
just in bold at the bottom. Each of these movements, with the exception of the kettlebell swing, you would reset before starting the next one. So you, you, I wouldn't ask anyone to do repetitive vertical jumps. We would jump as high as we possibly can, reset, get ready again, and jump as high as we possibly can, in much the same way that you wouldn't continuously swing a golf club over and over again. As I say, the kettlebell swing is the slight difference to that one. That's got a very repetitive nature to it. The muscle contractions are, are slightly different, um, but it also has a strong vertical force component as well. So set and rep examples, again, not, not particularly high. You want to be as explosive as possible, get a decent amount of rest in between each rep. As I said, reset. So you're looking at around five and fives um, to be really explosive on those. So you don't need to be up to the 10, 20 mark doing lots of jumps. Cool. So, so far we've looked at um, expressing uh, improvement, improving how you can express force, but you can also increase your range of movement, again, to work on that time component. So this is the top of Tiger Swing. Um, I, may, I don't want to speak for everyone in this room, but potentially not everyone can get into this position. Not everyone has that range of motion, especially when they're swinging the club in, in anger. So it's being able to unlock a few more degrees of range that are really going to help to get that force expression through more, uh, through more range of motion um, and increase the time component um, of our, our impulse equation. So if we, are, if we can't produce, increase our force expression, we can, get through more, we can work through a greater time period, hopefully quickly, um, to improve that, uh, that um, impulse. As I said, it's force over time, we decrease the time, we're still improving our impulse, even if we haven't changed the force expression. So range of, move, range of movement exercises. Um, head rotation is a really, really key one. You might have seen back on here, there's a huge range around Tiger's neck here. So just a very simple one to test this out. If everyone can turn their head to one side and bring their chin down to their shoulder. And if you can do that both sides comfortably, that's effectively the range that your shoulders and head go through when you're, when you're swinging through there. So that's something that might feel slightly silly, but just helps people to get through a little bit more range there. And I'm going to say... Just so you make sure they're all awake. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'll make sure you're awake. You're on my, you're on my left shoulder. Uh, so this is definitely not an exhaustive list, I should say. There's only about four exercises up here. Um, so wall rotations, really nice one. I use this a lot here. Andy will know that um, we use this a lot here. So this is for thoracic rotation, everything around the rib cage and upper spine. Shoulder dislocators, the shoulder is one of the most mobile joints in the body, so there's loads of things that you can do with them, but just a nice way to open up, potentially use a golf club if you're on the course or the driving range to get into this one. And then 90-90 hip rotations, so this person would be rotating side to side, almost like a, a, a window wiper type movement side to side, um, or um, performing some static holes in this position is, as well. So just to uh, wrap up my, my section, really, just to give you a bit of a session example of how all this might work. I've gone in a different order to how you might work through this in a session if you were training. So you would work through your range of movement stuff first, so essentially priming the body to produce whatever you are asking, asking of it. And then you go through the higher, the more taxing central nervous system exercises first, so the stuff that's not using your... Uh, using your muscles and going to give you muscle soreness, but the things where you can be as explosive as possible. If you think you're going to do a heavy squat session and then try and jump as high as possible, the squat session is going to limit how high you can jump, so it's best to get that stuff done first. This won't limit how much you, you squat, for example, or deadlift later on. So a couple of examples there of just how you might lay, lay that out. And then you're into your strength stuff. So I've written up here as well, RIR is reps in reserve as well. So one or two reps of each of these. Um, so that is a bit of a whistle-stop tour around all of those areas that I wanted to um, talk to you about tonight, guys. Uh, thanks very much for listening. If anyone's got any questions at all, then um, feel free to fire away. I've got a quick one. So if you yeah. chain for hypertrophy, let's say you continue doing that, would that be a negative or something that requires more explosive strength and mobility like this? 
Because obviously you're, 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 you definitely keep some in the range yeah. as a reserve there, so that tells me you don't yeah so generally I mean with with maximal strength training you don't need to train to an, a maximum every single time so if you're working a four or five your fifth rep let's say shouldn't be your absolute maximum effort you can you can make improvements at 80 percent of your um, of your repetition maximum so there's no there's no real data that shows or, or um, study that shows any improvement after 80 percent. Um, which is why we use that ballpark figure of, of one rep in reserve on that front. Um, to answer your question about hypertrophy, that has a lower force um, expression to it, so it's much more muscle dominant, higher repetitions. Um, so it, it just doesn't have quite the same effect as training for maximal strength does. That being said, it does also get you through lots of range of motion. Yeah, mix it up, but also training for hypertrophy gets you through more range of motion, yeah. which is also a good thing. Exactly. But yeah, I, I think it, it's, it sort of sits somewhere in the middle. It's, uh, it's a nice one to come back to maybe in the off season, but yeah, in, as we're coming into the spring now and thinking more about getting on the, on the course and the range, I'd probably go with more of this stuff. Yeah. So a lot of the stuff, if I followed it correctly, was on concentric activities. Yes. So your ability to produce force, that upward force. Mm. What, what, about, what about that sort of deceleration aspect to it? So that eccentric control in the follow through and things like that. Is, With regard to the, the, the follow through? Yes. Yeah. So if you look, look from a throwing point of view, yeah. so obviously a lot of your power comes from your ability to concentrically yeah. activate. Yeah. But a, there's an injury side to it if you have poor eccentric control, yeah. you have a problem with the shoulder. But also it shows that the better people will have a better eccentric component to it as well, mm. which is about force dissipation as opposed to force production. Yeah, so yeah. So I think. True in similar, the yeah, and and there's there's lots um, there's lots of research out there that shows it's it's people with better the the terminology that's used is amortization, effectively the ability to. Uh, block a joint or a segment of your body. So as you go through the swing, can you contract a, an area? Now you won't be thinking of this as you swing, but can an area stop moving to allow force to carry on further up the chain out of your hands and into the, into the club? If there's a, 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 the analogy I always use is like a leaky, a, a leaky hose pipe. So if you've got a hole in the side of the hose pipe, there's something that's not quite um, channeling down there, then that's going to limit your, your ability to, to swing. But effectively, yeah, it's about producing force and then breaking at the right time to allow that to continue further up, up the chain. Yeah, not, not quite in the, within the scope of what I was talking about today, but yeah, it's, um, uh, it's, it's a really key one as well. And again, the better you are at doing that, it correlates with lower handicappers or vice versa. Sorry, lower handicappers are better at doing that. So you talk about things like uh -huh. leg strength. Yeah. But if you build too much, you lose flexibility and movement, but you can also concentrate too much on the other body. Um yeah, I, I yeah, I would say don't concentrate too much in, in one specific area, I would say. It's a whole body movement, so everything needs to be integrated as one. Um the the idea of um Getting stronger and becoming stiffer is one that I don't personally buy into as long as you're doing range of motion stuff and, and having a holistic approach. Um, I think that is, that's quite a common fear with um, athletes and I'm sure it is with, with high level golfers as well is if I start lifting all these weights, I'm just gonna turn me into this sort of muscle bound person. I won't be able to move freely and fluidly. Um, but there's, there's nothing that, that shows that that's the case as long as it's done in a, in a progressed, sensible way. Um, but everything, everything should be integrated, yeah. Um, so I wouldn't say there's no one thing that you shouldn't do. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it, as long as it's all done on balance. Perfect. I'm going to hand over to you if that's all right. Perfect. Can I cool. Box in the middle. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Give you this as well. Brilliant. Uh, thank you. Uh, good evening. Uh, so my name's Andy Wild. I've been a professional since 1876. Um, I'm a, the head coach at Maple Durham, just uh, down the road. And I joined a 
before I started doing the golf stuff, I joined uh, Go Perform. I was introduced by a chum and Metris, and he did some individual stuff with me, which was absolutely brilliant. I wanted to get a bit stronger and get a bit of conditioning, a bit of flexibility. And the first thing we did was a bit of testing, and I think we were both incredibly surprised how flexible I was, because I could make Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, <laughs> or Friday. Uh, so I've been working with Trish for a couple of years and the guys, and um, I don't often get a chance to thank them um, publicly, but they do a brilliant job. I think, um, well, I guess we're all members, are we? No? What are you doing here then? <laughs> oh, just get them out. Um, but they do a brilliant job, and they've, they've got, uh, with Luke and Dan, they've, they've really created a sense of uh, community. Um, and uh, I've never, I've always gone to gyms for a few weeks and given up after a few weeks, but they kept me going for a couple of years. So they do something very special here. So if you're not a member, you should be. Get in and do it. Right, so um, I like it to be quite in, in, interactive, um, but I always find with, with audiences, um, uh, it's quite difficult to know when to laugh and ask questions, or whatever. So I've got three very simple instructions for you. Uh, if you join me with much enthusiasm. So when I put that up, well, that, that's pretty pathetic. Uh, that's one of the most important ones. Could we just practice that? Yeah, thank you. And then uh, that's for you. Thank you. Get out. <laughs> so just to get you, because you've been sitting down, what I want you to do is if you could just stand up quickly for me. Sit back down. Stand back up. And then really give that a bit of go. <laughs> that's great. That'll be on the website tomorrow. Andy Wilde receives a massive standing ovation for his chat. <laughs> Brilliant. OK, so sit down. Thank you. That's the end of that. So uh, a quick uh, quote from the great Arnold Palmer. So can I just say, actually, uh, are, we, are we mainly golfers? Are we all golfers? Hands up if you're a proper golfer, you play regularly. Oh, a bit slow on that. So I know we've got a scratch golfer here. Very annoying. Young and annoying, and everybody hits it miles. Uh, handicaps wise, the people that put their hands up. T anybody below 10 handicap? Very good, two at the back, they look a bit cheaper. What's your handicaps? Six. Very good, very good. Uh, 10 to 20? Very good. Above 20? Yeah. Terry, Terry's one of my golfers, but she's a good player. Good player, mm -hmm. just died. So, uh, a quick quote from Arnold Palmer. We all heard of Arnold Palmer? Anybody not heard of Arnold Palmer? because they're going to get that big get out thing. Yeah. So one of the greats. Golf is deceptively simple and endlessly complicated. It satisfies the soul and frustrates the intellect. It is at the same time maddening and rewarding and is without doubt the greatest game, he says mankind, but we should say humankind now, has ever invented. So I think anybody that's played golf finds it occasionally very simple and very easy and it goes very well for a few shots, few holes, few games, few weeks maybe, but then disaster hit. So if you're playing well, it won't last. And if you're playing badly, it won't last. Just enjoy the ride if we can. So um, the technical side of that was absolutely brilliant. I did actually understand most of it, which is great. My stuff's really, really simple. Can I have a hoop, please? Thank you. So we've got some good golfers and some average golfers and some people that haven't played before. So if you don't play, play, because it's the greatest game in the world. So my thoughts on golf are very simple. 90% of golf is set up. So if you get your set up right, you start in position. A bit like the gym stuff, isn't it? If you do a, ro a remaining deadlift, you've got to be in the right position, the right posture. I won't demonstrate because my back's not great. But um, so 90% of, of golf is set up. So if we get all that right, so the way you stand, the way you posture, the way you align, the way you grip, and that's not the same for everybody because everybody's a bit different. So if we look at someone like Jordan Spieth, He's got a very weak grip, funnily enough, hits it miles right when he gets it wrong, so, but probably been doing it too wrong to change it. And Matt Fitzpatrick's got a very strong grip, and they all have a slightly different way of doing it. But if you started um, from scratch and you wanted to be a nice golfer, a really nice golfer at uh, an amateur level, uh, do we talk about Adam, Adam Scott? Jan? Yeah, beautiful. So there's a few, there's half a dozen beautiful swingers of the golf club. And if you had a choice, I think most people would start like that. Although we like the Mickelsons, and well, not Mickelson now, do we? But, you know, hey, that's right. And the Bubba Watsons, we like the interesting ones, it's like Ronnie O'Sullivan playing snooker, isn't it? We like the interesting ones. But if you had a choice in golf, you'd keep it really simple. Um, so we'll go through that in a, in a minute uh, with Tris and show you what we think about setups, because that's the important bit. And then there's a few things in the swing. And with what Tris does in, in the gym, uh, if you can move well, it's great. So any of the guys I get in the gym that come play golf, it's great, because their bodies are ready to go and then we just teach them some very simple technical stuff, really. So, the golf swing is 
hoop. Actually, I need that as well. That's lovely. Okay, so let's see, just backtrack a little bit. So, very simple. Scratch, uh, scratch golfers don't need to know this, but there you go. So that is the world, and that black line is the equator of the golf ball. Okay, so in golfing terms, with an iron, uh, what you have to do is very slightly descend on the ball. So when you strike the ball, you're hitting the bottom of the ball, then you continue to go down into the ground to make a divot, and the loft on the club will hit the ball up in the air. So technically about four degrees downward blow, and a seven iron is a loft of? 13. Yeah, it depends where it is now. It used to be 37, but they decreased the, the loft all the time. So you've got positive loft about 37 degrees. You come down by four degrees, so you've still got 33 degrees of loft, and that ball will go up in the air, in the air every time. Most amateurs that start the game, when they start, even the six handicappers would have done this at the beginning. We try and lift the ball ourselves. So we see a lot of golfers, they try and lean, a lean back to try and get the ball airborne. And all that actually happens is they come into the ball and instead of hitting down on the ball, they start to lift the club up and they hit the top of the world. So if you hit the northern hemisphere of the world, the ball's just going to go along the ground. If you hit the southern part, it's going to pop up in the air. Does that make some sense? Lovely. So we have then, if we come to the hoop, this is everything you need to know about golf, really. So, can anybody see that black line there? Yeah? So if I had that on the ground, we would call that the low point. So we put the ball here. Everybody see that, just about? Yeah? So when you swing the golf club, in theory, the club stays on the hoop, so it comes up away from the ground. Then you descend, comes back down. There's a low point, and then it goes back up the other way. Does that make sense? Yeah? So if your low point, if I'm hitting this way, if my low point is back here because I try and lift the ball, I'm going to come down and either make contact with the ground or as I get to the ball, start to swing up, I'm going to top the ball. And that's what we see all day. So all the time when people start, they lean back, they stand up, they pull their arms in to try and lift the ball. Does that make sense? So if you want to get the ball up in the air, you've got to hit down very slightly with the iron. Good? Okay. And then if you talk about the radius of swing, and our scratch golfer and our six handicaps will know this isn't quite true, but you don't want to spoil the, the story with the truth. So if you imagine we had the club and we kept the club on that radius all the way through, it'd be very easy to get to the bottom of the ball, would it not? Where if the radius decreases, so the shape becomes a bit more of a rugby ball rather than a football, that would be much more difficult to collect the ball. Does that make sense? Yeah, good. And then we have, because we swing, the ball is a few feet in front of us, we have what we call the plane of the swing. So this hoop is a sort of on this angle, and as you swing, you stay on the angle of that, the plane of the swing, all the way through the swing. So if you did those three things, you were on plane, you kept the radius of your swing, and yet the low point was in front of the ball. So we came down, hit the bottom of the ball, and then into the ground to make the divot. That's going to hit the ball pretty well. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah? So the scratch golfer knows that actually, because you shift forward a little bit, this is not quite true, but nearly, isn't it? Yeah, good idea. So that's, that's the basic idea of the golf swing and hits the ball. So if you're hitting what makes a good golfer, he hits the ball, he finds it, hits the ball, finds it, goes in the hole, and the really good one signed for a 67, and the not so good signed for a 90. Pretty simple golf, really. Yeah, shall we get you on the mat and we'll have a little look? <laughs> or, we could, or we could use a scratch golfer. Come on, you, we we'll use you. Sure. Yeah, yeah, we'll get him on in a minute. So if we talked about um, ball position, Sorry, I, d I didn't get your name. Max. Max. So where would you, what, what's your ideas of ball position? What would you do? Depends on the club. Yeah, yeah, for a range, so sand iron. Middle. Middle, yeah. And then moving forward? forward yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's interesting how things have changed. So when I was, when I was training, um, and, and probably half the pros still teach the same, they would graduate. So the sand iron, most lofty club would be in the centre, and then it would graduate forward. What do you do, Paul? About that, yeah. About that. That's what I remember learning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. The, the, the interesting bit is, uh, so the seven iron should definitely not be in the centre of your feet, unless you're trying to hit the ball low or whatever. But that's the, the most common answer I get about where should the ball be. They say seven iron should be in the middle. No one's ever taught that, but they get a, yeah. that's the most common thing I ever hear, really. So quite a while ago, basically, uh, two sorts, really. I, either, um, where's Jan? Jan, what did your guys do, you know? You teach, you, you caddy for other... Um, Brilliant people, don't you? Do they vet? Do they vary it? Do they have a set position? What, do you? Well, ball position? Yeah. It's pretty, pretty much normal for, for most of them. You know, driver off the front. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they'll, they'll, they'll Irons. Work on 
Yeah, okay. So roughly about half the pros teach a graduated system. So the sand iron in the center and you gradually move it forward towards your left foot. Uh, about half the modern coaches now have a set position pretty much for uh, an iron, which is three inches off your left heel. Yeah, so that's what, uh, although I'm an old fellow, that's what I've jumped into. So what I say to my, particularly people in the early stages, there's so many variants in golf, we, we've got to get it as simple as possible really. So I do three inches off the left heel for all irons. Yeah, and that's it. And it's not, not amazingly different anyway, yeah. and then more forward for a driver. So again, it's just trying to, trying to find a blueprint that suits you really. So there's no, there's no absolute set way, but that's my preference. And I think when you talk to any golf pro, they have a preference of what they think is right. And if you follow everything I do, you'll be a pretty good golfer, but it's just them finding out what works for you really. Yeah, so off the left here, which is just forward of center. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I really like having the left toe turned out a little bit because if you threw a ball to somebody you'd always turn your toes towards the way you're where you're throwing and that allows you to rotate much easier so roughly about 30 degrees open so then you'll say well hang on justin thomas doesn't do that he's really straight with his feet but when he finishes he's twisted around so for me it's easier and if you look at tiger now because of all his injuries he's really open with his left foot so if you watch any of the guys on the senior tour, they're really open on their left foot to allow them to rotate through. So that, that's a good thing. Yeah? Does, that, doesn't he? Does, yeah, he's a fiddler, isn't he? He does loads of stuff, doesn't he? Yeah. He's posted so many videos now, it's amazing. Yeah. So, and then stance-wise, um, so one of my favourite golfers, Louis Oosterhazen. Uh, would, Jan, would you know who coaches him? He is. Do you know his, his coach? No. Yeah, so he's standing, has done for a while, really narrow for everything. And there's a couple of other guys I know that get coached, coached by the same guy. So it's obviously his thing that he, he wants you to be a bit close and maybe get a bit more handsy, I don't know. But he stands really narrow to the ball now. And then other people, I, I love Michelle Wee, although she just retired, and she's really wide with the stance. So again, it's getting a feeling for what suits you really. But I always think, if you think of your shoulders being a certain width, when I look at a good golfer, I want the sort of to match. So I like the idea that your shoulders are over your hips, your hips are over your knees, knees are over your feet. So we don't want the Eiffel Tower, but we don't want to be too narrow either. Just a really strong base. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. Is that similar to what you do? Ish? No, I actually, one of my problems is that I go too wide. Yeah. And then I swing. Okay. And then I swing. Yeah, yeah. So again, too wide, yeah. you're going to struggle to rotate. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so again, it's just finding a way that suits you, really. Narrow. Yeah. Yeah, well, two degree, both, both will work, yeah. Okay, so a nice wide stance, left foot turned out. That's pretty good. Lovely. And then things like, because your left hand's above your right, you should, when you watch most good golfers, the left shoulder's slightly higher than the right. Yeah, and I love, um, if you look at um, Max, wasn't it? Paul. Paul, that's Max. Um, if you look at the left arm and shaft, that almost creates a perfect uh, uh, Y shape. Can you see that from the right? To the left, so I love a, a, a line running through the left, left arm straight through to the shaft. That creates a slight forward press. Yeah, not that much. Yeah, just over the ball, really. Yeah, so that looks for me. That looks pretty, pretty good. Yeah, that's nice. And then posture-wise, nice straight back. So stick your bum out, get your back very straight, get your chest up. I always like the idea. If you think of a small melon under your chin, yeah, from there you could, you've got a lot of freedom to rotate. Yeah. We use other, we're going to use other fruits and things later on, but that's all right. Right, so you have a little go. Your hands are quite nice. Yeah, yeah. okay. A little, bit, a little bit tight, so soften the hands, Jan. Yeah? Soft, <laughs> Soft hands. Soft hands. So that looks pretty good, doesn't it? I think you look at that and go, that looks pretty good starting point. So that's sort of 90% right. And then, do you, do you want to hit a few and we'll see? Pressure. <laughs> pretty good swing, isn't it? What do you play off, sir? Um, 20, well, 21. 21. <laughs> <laughs> I'm an oldie. An oldie, yeah, well, join the club. Yeah, that's pretty good. Pretty good. Can someone pass me? There's a purple band somewhere I've left uh, yeah. on that stall. That's great. So, oh, well. oh, hey. <laughs> so, Paul's rather good. So, just do a backswing for me. Just to give you an idea of what sort of thing we do. Good swing, those. 
Okay, just let your arm, left arm bend a bit, your lead arm just bend it. So this is what you see a lot of the time where people just collapse this arm, and it's for a number of reasons really, but they can, if they don't hinge their wrists or whatever. But if we had someone like this, for example, can you just put that, forget about the golf club for a minute, give me that, just to give you an idea of some of the exercises. Put that round your neck and let, have it even in front of you. So you feel like a Catholic priest very shortly. Right, okay, and then what I want you to do is nice and tight and then grip, grip the ribbon as you would a golf club. Yeah, so that's it. So tight enough that you can feel that there's some stretch there. Yeah, but not, if you relax, it's not gonna whack you in the face. Yeah? Yeah. Okay, so if we've got a golfer that would re reduce the radius, what we say is, I want you to swing really slowly, almost like slow motion, and then keep the same tension on that band all the way through the swing. Yeah? Okay, and then swing through, use your hips on the way down. Good. Okay, now do that again. Now this time let the, let the left arm bend a little bit and then we see that the tension changes. Yeah? yeah? So we see a lot of golfers, they're trying to scoop the ball up, particularly through the ball. So have another go at that. It's a really great exercise. So you get the tension then keep the tension all the way through. So you, if you like, your head's a sort of centre point and then you're going to keep the tension and keep the width. That's good. That, left, that back swing looks a bit better now. Yeah, nice. Lovely. That looks pretty solid, doesn't it? That's a great exercise. Good for your body as well. Have we got uh, a really average golfer? Do you want to have? No, you did say you're 21, and you're an old fella. Do you want to have a little? Old. Do you want to have a little go? I'm very old. That's very good. Thank you. And eight's a, eight's a really good handicap. We're sitting around Bearwood Lakes. That's pretty good. Where do the uh, six handicappers play? Sorry? Boys, where do you play? Where do you play your golf? Oh, dear, it's nice, isn't it? Yeah, really nice. Great shame about Andrew Hall, wouldn't it? Oh, shocker. Is that any help to see that or not really? Um, I think maybe when we wrap up, we'll have yeah, a little play. Yeah. yeah. So 21, where'd you play, sir? In Essex. Essex, Christ, you come a long way. Yeah, just to see you. Yeah, brilliant. <laughs> I'd, I'd go a lot further personally, but that's great. Yeah, you got something going on with those hands yet? Sorry? It's all right, go on, carry on. Interesting happening with the wrist there. That's it. Okay. Oh, I'm going to get in the way there. Go on, carry on, sir. Yeah, it's all right. How long have you been playing? Well, a few years. Yeah? <laughs> Bad habits. Well, of course. Yeah, definitely go. Um, there's a grippy thing by the window. Good. <laughs> So this is uh, it's just a really simple thing. So if you had um, uh, a clay tube and then we put your hands on it and, and you, you squeeze and all the clay went through all the gaps, that's effectively what you'd, you'd have as a sort of template for a reasonable hold of the golf club. And we made, as an industry, we've made a terrible um, decision years ago to call it the grip. Put your hand out. Because if I grip you, I do that. If I hold you, that's a very different sort of image, isn't it? So I think we should hold the club, because we're talking about <laughs> hold the club softly, don't strangle it. So we hold the club, not, not grip it. It's a very different image, isn't it? Mm. Yeah? So let's see. Um, we okay doing this? Everybody happy? Yeah. Go through? Yeah? So if you just hold the club for me, I could get you up to, you're off 21 now, aren't you? I reckon I'd get you up to 28 pretty quick. It wouldn't take too long. <laughs> <laughs> So we've got um, in your hands, you, you do um, an interesting thing at the top of the swing, you sort of lose balance of the club. So with your hands, you've got a, what we call a weak left hand grip, so we don't see enough knuckles here, and then a strong right hand. And then as you swing back, we lose balance of the club and the, the, the wrist do something very interesting at the top of the swing. So if you let go of that for me. Okay, so if we, if we had someone who gripped it a little bit uh, differently, and it may, I don't know this, uh, your Mike. name? Mike, I don't, don't know Mike. Um, and it may be a case that he's played that way for too long and you, know, you, you only want to do a bit of effort to see if it improves, don't you, rather than doing something particularly different. But if you, so when you grip the club, you, this hand does this sort of thing and this hand does this sort of thing. So if we put you down by the side of your body here and you held that for a second. Now, if you walk down the high street in, in Reading, you'd probably get picked up, I expect, <laughs> but you'd be a bit like, you're like a gunslinger sort of thing. So if you just relax, your arms just sort of hang naturally and inside you a little bit. Yeah? So if we got this, this little pattern thing and you didn't do anything at all, get off, don't move, just nice and relaxed, don't, don't do anything. And we just bring that to it and then just bring your thumb across slightly. So 
Does that feel like that, that hand's a bit more round, a bit yeah. stronger, yeah. we call it in golfing yeah. terms? So you can see these knuckles a bit yeah, clearer now, can't you? Yeah? Stronger. Yeah. So if I grip the club with that, as I swing back, I can hinge very easily, get this wrist working very yeah. well. If I grip the club the way you did, I wouldn't be a, even make, be able wouldn't to make a backswing. Hinge. So the balance of the club is all wrong. So then if we do the same with that right hand, just relax it for me. This will feel a bit weird and you pop it on. Yeah, just fold your fingers gently around. that do. That's it. Good. So what we've got now, if you... Yeah, try not to get comfy. <laughs> That's a bit better. Now, from that position there, as you swing back, we can now support the club at the top of the swing. Can you feel this left thumb's a bit more under the yeah. shaft? And you were doing a bit more of this sort of motion. Okay. motion. Very strange. Uh, wrist position there. Now, once you're using your wrist probably, oh, that's tight. Yeah, you've got to relax a little bit. You've got a stressful life, Mike. <laughs> relax. That's it. That's a bit better. And then we can start using your wrist properly, get loads more power, and you better square the club a little bit easier as well. Okay. That's good. Yeah, and then if you did that ribbon thing as well, that would help. Yeah, but when you're strangling the club. Uh, and what happens is that feels then a bit weird. So it's a bit like um, you, drive, you drive a car, obviously. You come all the way from Essex. Of course you drive a car. You can't get here otherwise. Unless you do a helicopter, I guess. So uh, you come in your car, uh, and you could now borrow my car to go home. Uh, and it would feel weird, wouldn't it? It'd probably take you a bit longer to get home because it feels strange. Um, but once you've driven the car for three weeks, I'll call the police, you nick my car. But yeah. it will eventually it feel like your car. Bit. Yeah, eventually. But right now, you've just jumped in my <laughs> car and it feels a bit weird. Yeah? So the idea, grab one of those, get one of those, 20 quid, do that for a few nights, and then eventually that will feel a bit more, a bit more normal. Yeah? So that will allow you to hinge your wrist a bit. That will allow you to keep this a little bit straighter. Yeah? And then swing through. Makes sense. Did you see the, because he did this sort of claps wrist in the air. Uh, yeah, good. Have a few more goes? Go on, give him another bash. There we go. So that's going to feel a bit weird to you on the, uh, as you swing back. That all make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah? <clears throat> that's a bit better. Yeah, that left hand's a better position. Well, that's a bit better. Top a bit different up there? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and because it feels odd, so you're going to have to do a little bit of work before. So, uh, you guys know all this, but you start off, there's four phases of learning. You start off being unconsciously incompetent, so you haven't got a clue what's going on. Then you become consciously incompetent, I know it's wrong. <laughs> consciously competent, and then eventually, hopefully, unconsciously competent, you do it without thinking. So, for a lot of us, that's driving a car or what we do for a living, and it only really works when you can get to that level. And so I think that's probably what we're going to talk to Jan about. That's better with your left hand. Does this still feel a bit weird? So if I said one feels comfortable and ten feels really awkward, where would that be, that left hand? That's one of the things, yeah, after a while it starts to feel right. A little bit better, it, yeah? Yeah, you get a little bit more movement. Yeah, so where would it feel on the scale at the moment? So one's comfy, ten's rubbish? I'd say it feels about midway. Yeah, midway, yeah. okay, yeah. Most people say about seven or eight when we change things, so if it, if it feels like pretty awkward, that's quite normal, and then eventually that will feel a bit stronger. That's good. <clears throat> Anybody else want to have a go? No? No? You're a lefty, aren't you? Yeah. That won't really make any sense or work, really. But still Good. Not yeah. So that's, <laughs> I mean, in simple terms, and I've got two great failures, coach. I make it sound too easy. And um, there's another one I don't want to tell you about, but there you go. Um, I won't tell you too much. So uh, get, get a world class setup. Yeah, nice hold of the club, good posture, good balance, great alignment. Take as much time to get that right as you can. And do most of it at home, because if you worry too much about results, particularly when you're changing, you won't stay with it, you'll go back to comfort. So do a lot at home, get the kitchen tiles, make sure your alignment's good, get patio windows with good posture, uh, nice chin position, get your hands right, get one of those grip things. And once you're in that position, that's great. Go, go down to see, go perform, get your body working so you can do all this without really thinking too much. And it soon comes through. Um, and if not, come and see me and I'll uh, make you think. Uh, so last little thing I want to do is... Um, who, who, anybody that really wants to improve their golf? Really improve it? I've taken a 20 year gap, so I'm stuck. Have you? Yeah. Okay, so this is, uh, we'll do this with you. So what we want to do with, with handicaps is a bit, a bit like this, really. So you've got to watch uh, very, <laughs> you've got to watch very carefully. So what I'd like you to do, if you could, is blow on that, and a bit like your handicap, I want to make it disappear. Okay. That's got to be worth a round of applause, <laughs> hasn't it? <laughs> Well done. I, I
Say again? I wasn't sure to get out all applause. But yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, was, I couldn't get my notes. Yeah. Very good. OK, thanks very much. If anybody wants to stay after we've had a chat with Jan and do some work, we're happy to do it. And uh, you can get my contact, contact details and Trace if you want to do any work. Thanks very much. Thank you. So um, we're going to have a chat with our last speaker of the evening, um, which is Jan Squire. I'm going to let you introduce yourself properly, but effectively a caddy on the European tour, the DP World Tour. Yeah. Um, but Jan's just going to tell us all about her experiences and how what she has come across can help us as um, amateur golfers, hopefully um, aspiring golfers as well, just anything that she's seen in her time doing that. So thanks very much for coming down, Jan. So yeah, thanks tell us a bit me. about yourself, um, where it all started and, and what you're doing now. Okay, so uh, my name's Jan and it started a very long time ago in the early 80s and I went for a bike ride with my neighbours and ended up caddying at Berkshire Golf Club and thought, this is all right, this is more than my paper round. And, and it just evolved from there. And then I went to Sunningdale because the sausages were better at the halfway hut. And then when I left school, I didn't want to be indoors, so I stayed caddying at Sunningdale and then eventually went on tour in my beat up Fiesta down to Montpellier, the tour school with no windscreen wipers and off we went. <laughs> and that was it, I just stayed. And it's been a pretty good trip. Amazing. And, and, and what are you doing now? Tell us a bit about I'm where, where you're I'm still caddying on tour. It's been 31 years, I think. Uh, so it's all blurred into one and caddied for some uh, very interesting characters, let's say. <laughs> and seen all the ups and downs of the golf world. And uh, yeah, it's just mad. Amazing, yeah. So obviously ups and downs, that's what we're sort of talking about. And everyone experiences ups and downs yeah. on the course, some more than others, including myself. Um, so from your time working with, with golfers and observing others, what's, um, what do you say are the sort of uh, psychological or mindset fundamentals that the very best do? The very best, their routine is just rock solid and they're, they're visualising and they're just sticking at it and they're being kind to themselves and they're having fun. And the more you can do that, the better your results can be. Because if, you, if you're relaxed over the ball, you're going to produce better shots. You're not going to have. So if you can have a bit of fun and have a laugh along the way, that's massive. But the biggest thing of all is you've got to be kind to yourself because this is such a tough game. And you want to get over the next shot as clear as possible. And, and then just the more you breed good habits, like all the visualisation and everything like that, the, the rest is going to come. You've got the fundamentals and, and you just keep, keep improving. Keep improving the mental side is, is once you've got the fundamentals, you're away. And it's difficult, as we know, because this game will drive everybody crazy. Who hasn't been driven crazy by this game? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So in, in terms of how people reset, have you come across any um, interesting ways that people can get out of, get a, uh, a bad shot or a bad hole out of their minds? Apart from throwing a club. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, mean, I think the best just can get back on it. Like Monty would get easily distracted, but he was so good at getting back over the ball in his routine. He would do his 37 times table over the ball. That was his routine. That made him clear, visualise and go. Incredible, incredible talent really to be able to do that. But the more we can do that, the better it's going to be. So he would count in 37s up. He'd do just his 37 times one. table over the ball. Yeah, just clear it too. He wasn't thinking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever works. Yeah. Um, so what are, some, what are some common mistakes then that you think um, even professionals make, but amateurs make as well? I think um, hitting enough club. Obviously, we play a lot. We play in pro ams most week, uh, most weeks, and people just don't hit enough clubs. Uh, hit, you know, they don't get it up to the pin. I mean, I sometimes lie, and someone says, "How far is it?" And it's actually one ten, and I go, "It's one twenty." Because you know that most amateurs, higher handicappers, more so, they they won't get it up to that. They won't get it up to the pin. So I mean, if you can gauge your distances really well, you know, which you're all learning to do, and everybody, I'm sure all the low handicaps know exactly. And just just get that you're striking it pretty good if you're low handicap anyway. So just get up to the get up to the pin. Try not to air out the green though, okay? <laughs> um. Yeah, yeah, amazing that. So, um, what, what, what about the pros? What about 
sort of killers of rounds that you've seen? Is there anything that's sort of absolutely killed a round or that common things that you might, might have seen? Really being so hard on themselves. It's just, I mean, we all, people do it in life, don't you? You, you know, we, we do like to beat ourselves up a little bit. But if you can be kind, you're going to go to the next shot feeling, who's going who's gonna to hit a better shot? Me beating myself up or you having a good time and being more relaxed with your soft hands. Yeah. <laughs> you know, just, just be kind to yourself and enjoy it and have fun. Having fun should be your number one thing. If you could write down every day how much fun you've had on the golf course, you'll probably, your scores will probably come down. Absolutely. And you've said about belief in yourself as well, right? So there's a, a, a well-known player that you've told me about before who's got some belief in, in himself. Oh, yeah, OK. So you might have people like, um, that don't hit it as far as others, but they walk the walk and they talk the talk. I mean, Ian Pulsar will outmatch play anybody. He is incredible. He might not hit it as far as uh, Adam Scott, say, but his mental approach and how he carries himself is, uh, is incredible. Um, and if you, it's the same in life again, isn't it? If you, can, if you can do that and believe yourself and back yourself and walk around like the king, you're, again, probably going to score a lot less. Because if you're walking around, oh, I'm rubbish, I'm the king, I'm the queen you know, you're, you're probably going to do a lot better. Just, just basic psychology, really. So it must be a lot easier for people with that mindset to get out of, out of a bad shot or, out of that, or they don't have that self-talk, that negative self-talk after a, a bad shot. Yeah, they, if, if you positive, can... Then the next uh, one's going to be a better one. Got to leave it behind you, haven't you? As um, I was fortunate enough one time to be out with Tiger at Augusta and we got on the second hole and he's hit this shot on the second hole, and it's so far right, I've looked in my book, I've got no idea where that is. I'm like, this thing is 90 yards off the fairway. I'm like, I don't know what's over there, oh my goodness. And then he's, he's there and he's like, he's having a little rant. Then he's walking quick. And then all of a sudden he sort of stops, slows down. I'm like, oh, he's doing something here. I was, what is he doing? He's doing some sort of mental trick. Anyway, um, later on I asked him, and oh, by the way, he hits it out, somehow threads it out of the trees. He's now got a four iron in third shot on a par five. You can comfortably get up in, in two, where the wind was that day. And then he's hit a four iron to this and made a birdie. I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. That anybody else is taking eight. And, uh, and then I asked him later on, I went, what did you do there? We had a delay on the 13th tee. I went, what did you do on number two? He went. Well, have a little word with myself. Obviously, I'm not that happy with myself. I walk 10 paces. There's a white rope. Once I step over that, that shot has gone. The next shot gets my energy. I'm like, wow. Simple. But he, you know, he's worked hard on his mental side. But yeah. he's, he's been hypnotised since he's 12, 13 years old. And if we can just gently hypnotise ourselves... It will be a little asset for us. <laughs> I am the greatest. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to have fun. I'm going to be brilliant in my routine. I'm going to visualise. Right, they're pretty key thoughts to have. Absolutely, yeah. And I think you said to me the other day, didn't you, about you've got to talk your, yourself into what you want that day to be. So is it going to be fun yeah. or are you going to be competitive? Or... We have life stresses, don't we? So we can, we can almost set the tone the day before. Right, tomorrow I'm just going to have a giggle and I'm having fun. I'm, if you get results orientated, generally the pros don't do great when they're that result or results orientated. And it'd be the same, same when I'm playing, you know. And it's, I know it's hard not to look at the board or your card or whatever, but just to have as much fun as possible, tick it off. Amazing. Um, what about t kind of top tips then for us to take away today? Anything that you can go to the driving range tomorrow or play around next time that you sort of easily action from today? Going to the driving range, well, fundamental, your, your setup and your grip, massive. I'm, I'm with you there. I um, mean, that's just, it's so important. I mean, when you look at pros on tour, 99% of their problems will come from their setup. And it's, they, you'll find, try and go and looking and doing all this, and then someone will go, oh, well, your right foot's a bit back, what are you doing? And then, oh, I set up, and now my swing's in sync. So check, just reiterating what you say, your setup's everything and your grip. And um, 
and visualise when you're on the range. Not, it's not just standing there and smash it and working on your technique. I'd be visualising half the shots, having some fun, hit a fade, hit a draw, really visualise. And then when you get out on the golf course, you're more confident and you can hit those shots and you can have some fun with the wind and do this and do that. And golf's about having fun, isn't it? And the more sh shapes and little shots you can hit and big shots, practice that on the range. Don't just stand there and slog it with some... Unless, you, you know, you've got your coach who's working on whatever, do that for half the time and the rest of the time have some fun. But massively, visualisation is everything, <coughs> I think, from what I've seen. When, you, when a golfer's in their zone or whatever, well, I just see the shot and I hit it and that's me done. Oh, right, simple. Yeah. Why aren't we all playing off plus six? I don't know. Because yeah. <laughs> yeah. the game's crazy. <laughs> yeah. No, incredible. I think that's everything that I wanted to ask you about, Jan. Um, I don't know if I'll open up to the floor if anyone has, has any um, questions or any in, uh, insights you'd like to... How many clubs I've seen snaps? Or How many, like yeah. <laughs> I think uh, one of the things I would say is the kindness bit. Being kind to yourself. Yeah. Everybody needs themselves. Yeah. yeah. So Just creates tension. The sort of internal talk that most people have. We yeah. Never, hopefully never talk to anybody else like it. <laughs> 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 yeah. And, I think also not judging, they don't judge the shots too much. Yeah. Be a bit more casual about the results because the more you get focused on just the result, you get so tense. Yeah, I'm going to do better next time. How can I be better? How can I do it better next time? How can I be free? Ask yourself the right questions. It's basic psychology, really, but we, we forget, don't we? It's like anybody can get a bit lost going down the road in life, and then you're like, oh, hang on a minute, why don't I just do that? It's the same with golf, isn't it? Just It's basics. Like set up mm, and, and, and speaking nicely to yourself and just having fun. Just Tick off your routine. You know, if, if you went over the next year and you went out on the golf course, any handicap, and you just had a little questionnaire and you just how much fun did I have? How good was my routine? How clear did I visualise? You know, how well did I stick to all those three? And you give yourself a score out of 10 or ticks or whatever, and you put that next to your score, you will probably see they match up. And that's just a little something you could do just for a bit of fun. I know it's hard to stick to something, but the more, the more you do it, the easier it will come. It's like eventually learning to drive, isn't it? So is that something you've gleaned from the players, or have you, have you, have you implied that on your players? I've learned so much from the other golfers. And, and always been interested in the mental side anyway. But they've taught me a lot. I, one in particular in the early days taught me so much. He would like, right, draw a line on that. Right, tomorrow I'm going to be this, I'm going to be that, and I'm going to be that. I'm going to be free, I'm going to be in my bubble, I'm going to do this. And he taught me quite a lot. And it's all about routine, 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 stick to your routine. OK, so the ball's not going in the hole, but it doesn't matter. I've rolled it down the line and I'm going to do better next time. And once that ball's left, once that ball's left the putt ahead, I can't do anything about it. I'm just going to do my routine as good as I can all day long and see how, how, how my scores are at the end. It's a hard thing to do, but if you can crack it. Control the things you can control. Yeah, can, yeah I've learnt a lot. Um, Jeev Milka Singh taught me a lot. He was, his focus was incredible. He, I, I didn't tell anybody to stand still for seven years. I mean, he, it was just incredible how, you know, couldn't be technical with that swing yeah, that's all over fun. here. And it just all visualisation. And same, for seven years, I said the same thing to him on every shot, two seconds, because he wanted to look at the blade of the grass in front of the ball for two seconds to keep his rhythm. Seven years of saying two seconds. I was going to sleep at night going, two seconds, Jeeve, two seconds, Jeeve. <laughs> did you do it? Yes, I did. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, it's all about your routine, building your own routine and, you know, having fun with it. So who, who has, in had the most fun? Who's had the most fun? Or who's the most fun? Who's the most fun? Jeff was fun. Jamie Donaldson's fun. Mark Rowe was mad and fun. But also taught me a lot. Very mentally positive. Very positive psycho, I'd call him. You know. <laughs> um, I'm generally catted for quite positive people because... Yeah. Or if I haven't, then I've tried to help them become a little bit more positive, if I can, if it's possible. But people have got to want to do stuff, haven't they? Absolutely. Um, Luke's got a question. Just 
Jane, over most of my career, I've worked with teams with athletes. Yeah. And when it's going good, it's yeah. like no better place to be. Yeah. Working with them on the train ground, wherever. When it's not going well, they're injured. They've got mm. injury. Going, and you've got to spend six or seven hours in the company of that individual person. I'm just wondering, you've had a similar thing when six, seven hours in a day. And, I wish it was only six and seven sometimes. <laughs> yeah. How do you manage that side of things when they're on a bit of a downer for whatever reason? How do you? You stay upbeat. You stay upbeat, you stay positive. Because the minute they see you down, they're going to feel bad. So you stay upbeat, you, you, you stay positive. We're doing this, we're sticking to our routine. We're going to visualise. I'm going to get you to call the shot. You're going to, get, you're going to call the target. You know, like with some players it would be, I'm going to hit a little cut on that tree or, you know, I'm going to, they want to call the shot because then they're visualising it more. Um, so just keep doing that and keep doing that. Yeah, it is difficult when, it, when it's not going well. That's the hardest bit. But you keep doing your process and you keep doing your routine and just keep being patient and waiting for the good times to happen again. And that drives you crazy, but that's what you do. <laughs> no, but it is, it's... You've got to stay on the same road the whole time, haven't you? And you sit down, and you talk it out, and you go through your swing, you go through the mental side, and what can we do better? How can we get better? How can our routine get better? Should we visualise the shot and talk about it a bit more? You know, the actual finishing target. Should we be trying to hole out a 9-9, nine -nine, you know, because you've got a 9-9 nine -nine in your hand. If there's not water three yards away, you're going to want to try and hole it, whereas, you know, even the best of the best can not really properly look at a target, I'm just going to hit it left edge of the TV tower. Why? It's a 9-9. Nine -nine. You're a very good golfer. Try and hole it. That's the art of the game, is get the ball in the hole. And you f we all forget that sometimes. And just, so yeah, just keep, keep doing the right stuff and it will come back. But a lot happens with the schedule and over-golfed and... Yeah, and injuries, like you say, is the hardest thing. <laughs> um, Rob's got a question for you as well. Hi, Rob. <coughs> How do you prepare for a tournament and how does that differ? And then just after that as well, you mentioned our routine. I can right? only remember one thing at a time. When you mentioned our routine, mm. you have a process with your player that you go through. Is there a routine that you have yourself though mm. as you walk up to that shot, as you mm. walk up to that wall? How do you prepare and process that? Uh, well, the routine for the whole week, you mean? The, uh, the, so, yeah, the preparation the for the whole week, and then the whole week. as you're stepping into the shots, what do you think, or the, as you're stepping up to the ball? Yeah, well, so for the whole week, um, yeah, when you get there, you go and get the golf balls, the locker, and, and you pick up your yardage book, you're going to walk the course, but the yardage books are so good now, you can almost map it out from the book. So you're going to go and suss out the whole course, and then when they get there, we're hitting it on that left tree, 260's our max or whatever. And then, and then you're going to look all around the greens and see where the best bits are. And what, you can look at the pin positions, right, OK, we need to be one yard short of this pin because five yards long is no good. And you know, you're looking at all that. And obviously, you'll look at the wind for the week. So then you'll, you know, you'll be selecting. You, as I'm on a, if I'm on a hole and I'll go, right, if it's down a four club wind, this is our max. If it's in a four club wind, this is our minimum. And look at all that. And then the preparation for each shot. You just get into such a routine you do it so much. So you're walking up, you get your yardage. You've got your wind. I'll go clouds, wind map, compass in that order. And but so you're, you, you're probably going to know where the wind is before you get to the ball. Because you've got all that information there. And then, yeah. So then it will be, you've got your number, right, where do we want to land it? It's downwind, it's concrete, so I'm going to land it 20 short. Um, and it's down and off the left, so it's going to be playing 10 short of the yardage where we want to land it. And that's, that's your routine the whole time. And then depending on the golfer, it might be, um, some of them might not want to do targets at all. Other than, others might want you, want you to say, right, tell me to hold it. Or... Or they, or I, I, I get them to call the shot. What shot are you hitting here? I'm going to hit a little cut. I'm going to finish it a yard right of it. So yeah, that's you pretty much know what you're doing. But then obviously you've got all the other variables coming in. The temperature. How do players react when you step in and say stop? Well, you, if you need to discuss it before you're over the ball, because you can't, you're not going to step in while they're over the ball unless you've got a drastic wind change. Um, which doesn't happen that often, to be honest. 
Or, uh, yeah, no, they're good, because you're discussing it between you. You're getting it right between you. Some are comp sometimes, you know, they might not focus on where the wind is, and in the tree line course especially, it's like, no, the wind's here. How can it be there? It's just there. And because that hole was there, and it's, it's 8 o'clock, and... And, and then you should, that should all be done before, but then there might be some discrepancy. Can I get eight there? No, it's chippy seven. You sure can't get eight there? No way, it's chippy seven. And, you know, we need to carry the front edge or whatever. And you should be able, if you're having that conversation before, really. So you get it right between you, hopefully. Fingers crossed, legs crossed, your fingers crossed. <laughs> and then for amateurs, same thing, visualisation and... It should be no different for an amateur as it would be for a pro. The process. See it, feel it, do it. Easy. <laughs> we wish. <laughs> well, see it, feel it, do it. It's been around a long time. Think box, do, do box. There's many techniques. Um, but it's, that's why the game is quite interesting, isn't it? Uh, that's it, really, isn't it? It's just an interesting game. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Drivers crackers. <laughs> Amazing. Um, has anyone else got any questions? You talked a lot about <clears throat> golfers do. Yeah. What do golfers and, and the qualities they have? How do golfers, what do they look for in terms of high quality in the cabin? So how do, would you stand out? You know, you must have all your peers and, and, and new caddies. What do you look for? What would they look for? What they look for? What you know? How do you, you know? What does the modern caddy now need to do compared to, like you said, when you started? Is it the same? Or like it's the same. It's the same. It's the same. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Knowledge of the game, obviously. Rapport. You know, people tend to work with who they would know and that they've known for a little bit, or they might sometimes some managers might get involved. And I recommend this caddy. <coughs> what would they look for? Um, Upbeat, probably, you know, just generally good and good, good skills and professional. Or someone like one caddy, one player that's quite angry, he wanted a caddy to stand up to him and say, no, it's this, you're going to do it like this and you behave yourself and you get on with it. He didn't want a caddy just to go, oh, it's 160 playing 165. It's, a, it's an eight iron. Um, he <coughs> wanted a caddy that would be strong so they would each look they would look for different qualities somebody would look want maybe someone that's chatty and uh and someone would want someone strong do you then have to adapt your style depending mm -hmm. on the player you are knowing what their strengths and weaknesses are and also their great personality? question yeah. great question every single player is so different and that is the art you adapt to that player some of them like i said earlier might want to really into the targets some of them I caddy for one Japanese player, he just does most of it himself, and then you caddy for someone else. Right, what am I hitting it? What am I in it with? And how am I hitting it? And what shape? And That's so. Like me, I think. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So, yeah, they're all extremely different, which is probably the interesting thing, yeah. most fun thing. And then obviously you've got people click, and, 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 and that's it, they're away. And then they have great success because they've got a good rapport and they trust each other and can be with someone for years. Yeah. Good question. Brilliant. Fantastic. It's very lonely out there, coming from the golf club, and particularly when it's not going great, so you've got really <coughs> bad things. Uh... In America, yeah, it's a lonely place. But in Europe, no. There's always people around and it's quite tight. Yeah, yeah, that's what I meant yeah. on the golf course. On the golf course, easy, yeah. Easy, easy, yeah, easy, yeah, yeah, your caddy is... Uh, your confidant. If, if anybody wants to know what's going on, ask the caddy. <laughs> <laughs> Why are they not playing great? I don't know, ask the caddy. <laughs> no, do, you, do you have code, oh, because they say it's hitting eight time on the telly then, do you, do you, do you have codes to, to the telly? Uh, it, look, if the commentator's there, um, yeah, you might, we might go like that, or yeah, just yeah, at six, yeah. or you know, yeah. no, we're at nine. It, or four, whatever, you know, so yeah, they'll, they'll, they, but they, they know anyway, most of them. They might, they might get your numbers before you go out, if it's a, on a weekend game anyway. How far do you hit your 9 or 165? And so they'll get a gauge, and they know where the wind is. They've, most of them have played, and they're very good.
Not they make it, I mean, yeah, 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 but they're, they're generally pretty bang on, um, like you know, Richard Boxall and all those, they've been around forever, they know they're really they're they're good, yeah, all good, brilliant, fantastic. I think we'll wrap it up there in a moment, yeah. Before we do, you told me a, ma a really good story about Tiger. You said about him hypnotized from the age of 12, that about him at the open. And the referee. Oh, yes. So just to finish with this, because you told me this the other day and I thought it was yeah. great. Okay, yeah. So he's, uh, you know, athletes and they're getting in the zone and the flow. And, you know, a lot of golfers might self-hypnotise themselves before they're going out anyway. Some might go and have a 10 minutes in the locker room, whatever they're doing. They've done it in the morning, the night before. Anyway, <sighs> so Tiger was, I can't know which Open it was, but he was playing in the Open and... John Paramore, the late John Paramore, was uh, the referee, and, you know, in the open, the refs actually walk around with the game. And so they introduce themselves on the, on the tee, and then they play the 18 holes, get to the 18th green, finish, just about to go and put the scorecard in. John Paramore says to Tiger, oh, thanks very much, so thanks, thanks, well, that was a good game. He says, hey, JP, where have you been? I haven't seen you forever. Well, he's introduced himself on the first tee and he's walked 18 holes of him and he hasn't noticed him and he's like one of the most famous refs in the world, isn't he? And just goes to show how in the zone that someone can get. I mean, that's full focus, isn't it? He's not going to beat himself up. He probably didn't even know where that white rope was that day. Mm. <laughs> I don't know, but it's, it's quite an eye-opener, isn't it? But... It's your life, but yeah. golf is life sometimes, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> That's why that was a great story to, yeah. to finish on anyway. But yeah, thanks so much, Jan. Oh, and, thank uh, you. Well, I haven't got Andy's card to hang Thank you. Right, we're all going to go and shoot 67 tomorrow, yeah? All of us, <laughs> absolutely, <laughs> to a person. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Thanks so much for coming down, guys. Um, we've uh, recorded this, so if anyone wants the link, then... I'll tell you what I'll do, I'll grab a piece of paper and if you want to leave your email then um, we can send you over the link if you want to watch it back later on. Um, cool, thanks so much for coming down guys and hopefully we'll see you soon. Thank Cheers. you. Well, we're I'll going on the now. force plate now. Oh yeah, we'll do all that, <laughs> all the testing now.